Hey, welcome back once again, UCISSP wannabes. These are the IT Dojo CISSP questions of the day. I am Colin Weaver, and every single day I give you not one, but two questions to ponder and contemplate. Let's go ahead and get right to it. All right, question number one today coming at you on the board. IP version six introduces a lot of different rules for IP address structure. My question to you is, is given this list of IPv6 addresses, which of them is a valid destination IPv6 address for sending traffic to a node or nodes on the internet? Go ahead and click pause and look at those closely. And then when you're ready, click play and we'll break it all down. All right, let's look at it. Uh, choice number one, FE80 colon 469, a bunch of other stuff, negative. FE80 screams link local IPv6 address, and those are decidedly not routable, nor are they usable on the IPv6 internet. So that is not one of the correct answers. Okay, choice number two, 2002 colon 4688 colon a bunch of other stuff. Yes, if you look closely at that, you'll find a couple things about it. One, 2002, the fact that it begins with a two tells you that it is a globally routable prefix. Anything that begins with a two or a three is currently in the globally routed prefix range. And if you count it all out, you see that there are actually eight blocks, of, uh, each of which contains 16 bits of data. And those eight blocks times 16 bits is where you get your 128-bit 128 IPv6 address from. So that is absolutely a valid globally routable IPv6 address. In this particular instance, it's a destination unicast IPv6 address. Third choice on the list, FDA7 colon something, something, something. Uh, no, that is not. Anything that is FD um, is actually part of the unique local IPv6 address space. And the unique local address space is sort of a locally routable yet still private IPv6 address space that is available for use within your own internal organization. Um, anything that starts with FC00 uh, colon colon slash seven, which is expressed because of the way the RFC is written as FD anything, is going to be uh, unique local and is not going to be routed on the global internet. So uh, that is not one of the correct answers here. Next address, 2620 colon 0000, colon some bunch of other stuff. Uh, it's looking good until you get to the fact that there's a G in it. And IPv6 addresses are written in hexadecimal and that junk ends at F, not G. So no, sliding a little G in there is good. Now, in real life, this is never an issue. You can't put a G or an L or something like that in an IPv6 address because the system's gonna beep at you and say, no, it's not cool. But I guess you could put it in a text file or something like that and have it be screwed up. But if you're doing this in any kind of an interface where you're running a command or putting it into a graphical interface, you're gonna get something that comes back and tells you that it's not valid. The most common place in all honesty where you're gonna see things like G's and L's and stuff in an IPv6 address is when you take an exam. So yes, look alive for it in real life when you're messing around with text files that might be read by a process later on. Uh, but really, you know, just pay attention to it and know what the actual ad correct address structure is for IPv6 addresses in terms of the fact that stuff's all written in hex. All right, next address up is 3000002341. Uh, everything is looking great with this address. 3000 is a globally routable prefix. Again, anything that starts with a 2 or a 3 is going to be globally routable, except if you look closely at this address, when you get to the very end, the double colon notation is used twice in the address, and that is a party foul when it comes to IPv6 addressing. So you're allowed to use a double colon notation once to represent a run of zeros, but you may not use it a second time in the same IPv6 address. So no. Not correct. All right, next guy on the list is FF1E colon 40 colon 2002 colon a bunch of other stuff. Yes, this is actually a valid IP address in the context of the question because this particular address starts with FF, which means it's a multicast IPv6 address. Then it has a one, which means it's a transient or temporary IPv6 address. And then it's followed by an E, which means it is a globally routable or it's a global address. So anything that's FF multicast one transient E globally routable is actually a valid destination that we could send a packet to on the IPv6 internet and have it be routed towards this destination. So uh, the question asks you about node or nodes, and in this case, this is actually one of the right answers, even though it's a multicast IPv6 address. All right, your final answer choice is FF02 colon colon five. Uh, no, uh, FF, that's multicast. Zero means local to the link. 
and colon colon, it means a whole bunch of zeros, and then the five at the end is actually, in this case, specifically reserved for the all SPF routers multicast.pv6 address, which is this is how we talk to and locate um, other OSPF routers, like saying hello and things like that in a, in a locally routed environment. But uh, these particular, or this particular destination multicast.pv6 address is only good for communicating on a local link, um, uh, and it won't be routed on the internet. So you wouldn't be able to send this to anybody else that's uh, you know, more than a router away. All right, here comes question number two. Uh, you've been given a two terabyte uh, ATA hard drive that spends at 15,000 RPMs, and you've been told that you need to erase the data on this hard drive in such a way that standard uh, keyboard style recovery techniques are not gonna work. At a minimum, what do you have to do? Here's your answer choices. Go ahead and click pause, think about it, and when you're ready, we'll break it all down. All right, first answer choice, use a data purging tool. Uh, what this whole question about is really the distinction and the definition between clearing and purging. Purging, uh, by definition, is going in and erasing a media in such a way that it cannot be recovered, the data on it cannot be recovered, using advanced laboratory techniques. Uh, this is considered a more aggressive form of erasure than what clearing would normally be. So in this case, even though this is technically something we could do to go in and make sure that standard keyboard techniques aren't going to work, the question asks what you must do at a minimum, not which of these are valid, but what you must do at a minimum. So let's keep looking at the other answer choices and see if there's something better. Choice number two, physically destroy that junk. Yes, that will work, but is that the minimum that you must do? Not quite sure. Let's keep looking. Third choice on the list, use a data clearing tool. This is what we're looking for. A data clearing tool is a tool that's gonna go in and erase a media, your hard drive, in such a way that standard uh, data recovery tools, such as that you might use from a keyboard, um, are not gonna be useful in being able to recover the data. So this is gonna go in and get rid of things that are in free space, it's gonna get rid of things that are in slack space, it's gonna get rid of all the data that's on the system, and uh, any of the sort of standard, you know, off the shelf or even, you know, expensive ones, if you will, that you might go in and try and use to recover the data sitting at a keyboard isn't gonna work. You're gonna to have to go into a laboratory um, if you wanna go beyond this. Uh, but clearing is exactly the answer that we're looking for here because it is the minimum thing that we must do. So let's go ahead now and look at the last choice. Um, and that says to format the drive using a file system that was not previously used. Uh, that's just some made up junk. Uh, if you were to go in and do that, all the data would still actually be on the disk. So no, don't do that. Uh, the answer that you're looking for in terms of the bare minimum that you must do is to go in and actually use a clearing technique. And if we were to kind of put this in a hierarchy, we could say, you know, one, we could just, you know, throw the drive away, just dispose of it, which is a bad idea. Uh, two, we could go in and uh, clear it, which is to go in and erase it in such a way that standard keyboard techniques aren't going to be able to easily recover the data. Three would be to purge it, which means to go in and erase it in such a way that it's going to require some freak mode junk going on in the laboratory to be able to go in and get it back. Uh, and four would be to physically destroy it. Um, now, when you get down to this, you start thinking about okay, what should I do with this disk? If this disk contained information that was of a particular sensitivity where you're this kind of freaked out about it, a lot of organizations just look at the, the, the sensitivity of the data and compare that to the cost of new media and just go, you know what, it's not worth it ever being a topic of discussion. So why don't we just physically destroy that thing and then we'll go in and just start with a brand new disk. All right, there you have it. Two more questions down. Hope you dug them. If you did, click like. If you want to get them every day, click subscribe. First question today was on IP version 6 addresses and being able to go in and look at the little nuances and address structure and make sure you understand what that format is. And the second question went in and talked about the distinction between clearing and purging. And I want you to make sure you feel good about the difference between the two in the exam. Uh, that's it. See you tomorrow.